Okay, let's get started. So hello everyone and welcome to our ICAM Foundation webinar on macro programming part two. My name is Alexander Gordon and I'm joined by my colleague Daniel Wang who will help me on the presentation for today. Yep, hi right, everybody. So for today we will go over uh, our macro flow uh, control specifically on the branching control and the conditional loops. And afterwards, we will go over some examples on uh, the branching control and also on uh, some other subject that we touched on the last webinar. So for the macro flow control on the branching control, we have two statement. We have the if statement and the case statement. Uh, the if statement will look at a conditional test, and if that statement is true, it will uh, get in the branching, while the case statement will look at the value of the variable, and if it match one of the cases uh, to be applied, it will go to that branch and apply it. So for the if statement, we have, if we look on the top left, we have our very basic if statement where we have a test and we look for example, if a variable is equal to this value, then we will go inside of the, uh, the we will process the statement. If a, a specific variable or uh, is equal to true, so a logical variable, then we will also st step inside of it. Or we can have a little bit more complex if statement where we have multiple conditional tests. So if we fail the first one, we will go to the second one and see if it works. If it doesn't work, we will go to the next one, so, uh, so on, so forth. And we can also have a else. So if all the above conditional tests fails, it will branch into that statement and uh, process it. At the bottom, we have an example where we have uh, tools from 1 to 60, and we want to apply a, uh, probe, a tooling pro, uh, probe for tooling to check if everything is okay before doing machining. So on the first one, we're checking if we are tool 1, 10, and 20. If it's equal to one of those values, then we process, we enter a specific uh, probing code. And then if we are from 2 to 9, we have, uh, we are greater than 1, so strictly greater and strictly uh, strictly less than 10, then we will process it. And then we have the next one. If we fail the first two one, we have the third one where we uh, are greater or equal to 11, and, but less than equal of 60. You would say, okay, well, normally 20 is inside of those, but since it is already included in the first one, it will, uh, it will not process 20 on this one because it will trigger on the first one because the if always goes the conditional test in order they are appearing in the code. And if none of those, if so example, you have tool 61, well, it's not a valid tool and you will have an error going outside. Then you have the case, huh? as I've said, which is looking at the variable value and then depending on what's its value, it's gonna jump straight to the, uh, the case huh? Uh, that match. So compare uh, in comparison to the if statement, which needs to process each and every uh, conditional test until it finds a true uh, a test that is true. This one will calculate, uh, will check which one it needs to go. For example, if I had tool 30, it will go straight to the when 11 through 60, since it is between 11 and 60. But basically, a if statement and case statement is exactly the same thing, just ordered uh, in, the, in a different way. Then we have the conditional loops. Uh, we have three types of loops, the do loop, the while loop, and the repeat loop. And we can also exit those loops if we are meeting a certain condition that you, uh, that you want to make sure that, okay, I have enough, uh, I have populated stuff enough or I've done enough uh, operation that I need to exit there and keep going on a post-processing. We will see that a little bit later. So for the do loop, it's very uh, simple. It's just repeat the statement a certain number of time. For example, uh, here we have an array of 100 argument and we are populating each and every position of that array with the value minus one 
So we start at one and we increment by one until we reach the uh, the end until we reach 100 and then every position of the tool array will be populated or you can also go backward if you specify the step my, uh, minus one and then it will start from 100 to a one and go down then the while loop it will check a condition at the beginning if you meet that condition so if that condition is true it will go in the state uh, inside of the while loop process the statement and repeat the statements as long as the condition is true. So as soon as it's false, it will step outside of it and uh, continue on with the post-processing. So here, same example as with the do loop, but with the while loop. So as long as we're less or equal to 100, we will, we will uh, input the value minus one to the position and then increment the position by one. And then you have the repeat loop. The repeat loop will step inside of the uh, repeat loop and will have the conditional test being done at the end. As long as that condition is false, it will repeat the statement. As soon as it becomes true, it will step out of the repeat and continue on with the post-processing. So here again, same example, uh, initializing the tooling array but using a repeat statement instead. Then we have the exiting loops because sometimes depending on how you do it, you might have an infinite loop. Uh, infinite loop. You might have a condition that you just don't know how long it's gonna take to achieve. So you're gonna keep, you know you, you're gonna achieve it at one point, but you don't know when exactly it's gonna go. So you wanna repeat and repeat and repeat so on and so forth until you reach that condition. And then afterwards, you want to exit of that loop because you don't want to get stuck in there. So for example, if you are, you have here a while loop, as long as i is less, uh, less than 10. But if we look inside of the loop, we have no i. So on the while loop, we already had an infinite loop. And if we have, uh, we look at the repeat loop, well, we have until false. If we remember, the repeat will step out of the repeat loop when the, ver uh, the conditional test become true. So it's kind of impossible to have false equal true because they are opposite of each other. So we are stuck inside of two, condition uh, two infinite loop and we need to step out of them. So here what we have is that we have an if statement that says when I have j equal to 12, well, I want to exit two level of, uh, of my loops. So here, level one, level two, and then we continue processing. So I'm gonna leave it to my colleague, Daniel, to explain the first example and go over it. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, so here we'll go through a quick example uh, where we'll be touching base on some of the string formatting that we learned um, on the previous webinar. And we'll also cr be creating um, two user-defined macros, one to in your unwanted work offset, uh, and a second one to capture a custom cell command that will split our first positioning move um, according to some program value. Um, and we'll be splitting the motion in X, Y, then Z, X, Z, then Y, and finally Y, Z, then X. Um, so let's hop on to Quest and see how that goes on. All right, so here we have Quest. Um, we have an arbitrary um, pulse processor and we'll, and there's also here um, in Jenner, we also have an app source, um, an arbitrary cell file that we created for this example. Um, let us run this sample real quick. So we see here, there's a couple tool changes. Uh, we can also see in the CL file, we have our um, custom command here with the uh, plunge option. And we're also getting a couple of messages that we may want to remove to have a cleaner um, listing file. Um, and also maybe add on a header. So let's start with adding a header. We'll go into post-processor customization. We'll go to search down procedures. And then we'll add a header at the machine startup. Um, so here we'll just do a custom macro. Um, so the first line will be the line that shows up in the um, in the procedures there. Uh, so we like to 
put a comment so that we know what's under, uh, what's inside of the body. And to output a um, comment to the tape for the header, we'll be using the pprint statement. Um, so let's start with, let's say, um, with the NC file name. So, and also for string formatting, right, we'll use the exclamation mark. And because we know it's in, we don't really care what, how the output looks like, um, we could put a star. Um, but because there are characters here, we'll just use the um, capital A uh, to just really don't really care about the actual format and capitalization, right? If you want to capitalize everything, there's functions to do that. Or if you want um, for lowercase, you can use the lowercase a here, um, but we don't really mind how it looks like. So for the NC file name here, we could use the function, uh, one of the dollar functions here, dollar F. And you can see there's a nice drop down menu for uh, completion. So we'll look for base name. Um, again, it will autocomplete as you add in more line. You can hit the tab, it will autocomplete. To know more about these functions, there's two ways to look at it. Um, you can either look, find this in the manual, post 230 PDF document that comes with your uh, installation folder, or you could use the online help um, by hitting the F1 key on the keyboard. And it will uh, look up that function and provide you with some information. Um, you could do this with a lot of the functions and a lot of system variables, and they'll, they'll come with um, their syntax, how you write the syntax, and a brief description of what it does. Um, so you can either find this again here in the um, online help using the F1 key, or um, you can look it up in the post 230 um, documentation with your installation folder. Um, so moving on here, so the F baz name here will um, find the, uh, will give the base name and we want the tape name. So tape name, dollar tape name. Again, you can hit the F1 key um, to look what it, what it means. And because I want to only the name, I'm going to strip everything past the period or the dot here. So this will give us the NC program name. Uh, maybe you want to add in the uh, post processor name. So again, we'll use the pprint command here and post name, for example. Again, we're ignoring the, um, the casing, uh, whether it's upper or lowercase, we don't really care. And for a post processor name, we can use the system variable now, pp file. Again, auto completion. Um, for those wondering why you don't, you may not have auto completion active. So you can right click anywhere inside the box, uh, the window writer, and then check the enable word completion. Um, you can also check the line numbers um, for just to look nice and it's easier to debug. Post name here, we can also add another P print. Um, to for the programmer name, for example. So we'll do posted by, keep the same formatting here. Um, so for the, for, the, for the programmer name, what we can do here is use the environment variable um, and look for the username. So whoever is posting uh, will always have that username uh, being output. So to do that, we can use the function fget env. And to that, we'll add the string username. So that will get the environment variable uh, username and we'll output the name of that user. And finally, maybe we wanna output the date. Right, uh, same format, uh, we could be using star if we don't, we're not sure what the formatting is, uh, but we'll keep it like this. And we can use a system variable dollar date to get the date. Right, we hit compile here, no error, that's good. Go back to, to Janair, roll back. And now, because we know it's um, at the top of the file, we'll click in the output a couple times and we get our output. So 
we have the NC program name here. It's called foundation. Um, that's just the name of the CL file. We have the post name here. We have the person or the, uh, the programmer name, and we got the date. That's nice. That's a nice header. Um, for As a bonus here, there's two methods of formatting a date, or there are mo more than two methods, but here are uh, two really nice methods of formatting a date here. Um, you can shrunk the, the date that you saw previously by controlling the number of characters here. Um, so I know it's exactly 11 characters. Or you could use um, the, the function, the date function, which is $fdate. Uh, and then here it takes an R as argument um, percent x here to output the shorthand version of the date uh, again you could do the online help to see what um, f date is and all the syntax attached to f date now if you rewind again and click a couple of times in the output. We get a shrunken version of date now. We don't have the time that we need. And also the F date here shows in a short written version. So those are two methods to um, you know, just write a date. And that's really how you would create your header. Um, if you want to put this, you, know, you can play around with the positioning inside of your, um, here you can play with the positioning of your macros, um, but we will we'll leave that for a different time. So now, Let's get rid of those error messages that were appearing on um, the console. So if we run the code again, we can synchronize onto that message. And you can see that the cut command adjust here is causing those messages. And you can look for the second one. And these are essentially work offset and they're just recalling the same work offset. So we'll, let's make, let's write a macro that removes the message, or rather, that doesn't process anything that's being repeated. So here, we're going to use a defined syntax macro. We'll add, start typing the major word, find the one we want, hit OK. And we'll start typing our uh, user-defined syntax line here. Now, we know that the major word is cut com, and we want to catch it when it's on and when it's the adjust, right? You may have different commands. We want it specifically on when it's on and when it has the adjust on it. And to catch the number, right? Sometimes it may be one, sometimes it may be two. We'll use the dollar $p variable. So we'll just do dollar $p1 here. We'll use one of the branchings, uh, one of the branching loops we've learned today um, to have a condition so that when it's uh, different, we want it to be, uh, when the, the fixture offset is different than the current one, we want it to be output. But if it's the same, then we don't want to do anything. So here we'll do a condition on if $p1. If it's not equal to this system variable $tcf, which stores the uh, fixture offset, then we want to just simply output. And then we can close off the statement. Hit compile, no error. Now we can roll back here on the tape. Set a breakpoint on .com here, and we'll see that the first time around, dollar $TCF has never not been processed yet. Therefore, the value is negative one. So we're going to output and DJ54 outputs. And the second time around, because the dollar $P1 value is the same as the current work offset, then we will skip over it in your having 
right? And the third time around, same thing happens. So now we have a clean uh, console with no errors or no messages being output. Right? So that's a nice way of just ignoring uh, unwanted uh, work offsets or rather repeated work offsets. And finally, now we'll adjust to our plunge option here. We'll again, create a new user defined syntax line. We'll start typing plunge, hit enter, autocomplete. Now we know the word option is a, comes first and then we'll be catching the values one, two, three, etc. cetera. Um, to change things up here, we'll instead of the if statement, we'll use the case statement. So we'll do a case on dollar P1 and we know we have three options. One, 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 two, one, three. And then we'll be closing our case statement here. And our goal here was to split the motion. And to do that, we could use the safety command. Safety command will allow us to split any positioning motions. Um, and so we can do safety x-axis, y-axis. And then if we put the next here, z-axis, this will essentially say move in x, y, and then follow that with the next z-axis. We also want to add the next at the beginning to make this command only do do it once. All right, so if you did not have this next, then all your position all your positioning move will be split. Um, but with the next modifier at the front, it will only happen once. And now we can copy this code to our other cases and change the axes. So now here we want to move in x, z, and y, for example. And here we want to do it in z and, and in x. Um, the order here doesn't matter. Right? The output order will always follow the register order. Now, now if we look just before we re, uh, re, re, re roll back the tape here, we can see that the output is x, y, z all on the same line. But if we roll back, Put a breakpoint on plunge. Use the F1 to step into to see that we're going into each and every case. Clicking on the output. First case, we have the XY split. And then second case, we'll have the XZ and then Y split. And finally, we'll have the YZ and X. So that's one way of creating a, a nice simple macro to split the motion um, however you want it. And now I'm going to give back the control to Alex here. We'll, he'll touch upon the second example. Thank you very much, Daniel. So for the second example, give me one second. What we want to do for the second example is we want to make some correction to some commands that would have the incorrect options uh, inside of it mainly when you have a cycle tap that would have been programmed with linear feed rate, we want to have per revolution feed rate. So we will do some modification to that. And also we want to adapt our post to be able to use what we call neutral CL data. Neutral CL data are uh, program app source and CI file uh, CLS uh, that would be able, uh, would be compatible with multiple machine that has similar kinematics, but has different specs. For example, one machine could have a higher maximum spindle rate and or limits. And we want to make sure that this CL data is being adapted to each and every one of them. So usually you would program with your most capable machine and adapt your post to uh, lower the spindle speed and feed rate or adapt the limits to uh, match your a specific machine. So here we'll take the spindle example where if we have a spindle speed that is faster than what your machine is capable of, we will output the maximum uh, spindle feed, uh, this maximum spindle speed, and then calculate a RPM reduction factor and apply it to all the feed rate that will follow that uh, spindle. 
and then if we uh, close, if we turn off the spindle, we will reset that uh, RPM reduction factor to one. So let's go back to Quest. Uh, so I'm gonna close this one. I'm gonna close this post uh, and open or example number two. So if we go to the spindle section, in the range data, we can see here, my machine can go up to 15,000 RPM. So the first thing I'll wanna do is I'll want to create a global variable to uh, store my RPM factor, and that way I can access it at any time during the post-processing. So I'm gonna give it a name. So this is going to be global variables. And then I'm gonna declare my variable using declare. And then I'm gonna give it a global range with a real type. And I'm gonna name it. So I'm gonna name it GR for global real, then RPM, then and factor. And I'm gonna give it a value of one because if you do not give it a value, it's gonna be initialized at zero. So the first thing we want to do is we want to, uh, we will go over the cycle tab command. So I already have a cycle user defined syntax. So I can just double click on this, uh, on the cycle. And when I add my new macro, it's already going to have the cycle selected for me. So my cycle tab, let's take a look at how it looks in our app source. So we have our cycle tap, and then we have the depth of the tap, uh, the tapping we want to do. Then we have our linear feed rate, what's uh, what's the value, and we have some extra parameters that uh, we will output as is. We won't touch them. So I want to strictly catch this macro on the tapping cycle. So I'll put uh, I'll hard code the tap, and then afterwards the first arguments. Since they are in two arguments, I want to catch them and I don't need to process them. So I'll just put a $P1 star. Then my $P2 for my uh, type of units. Uh, we want to make sure that this macro works for uh, post in inches and in millimeters. So we're going to make it that it is uh, generic. So IPM for inches, MMPM for millimeters, and per min for if it's not defined in the CAM system. Then its numerical value will be assigned to $P3. And we have $P4 with a star to catch the rest of the macro. First thing we want to do in that macro is if the spindle is off, we want to turn it on. So I'm going to do a conditional test using the system variable S mode. And if we look at what is S mode, this is the state of your spindle. So right now spindle mode can go from zero to three. And we want to make sure we want to do something only if it is off. So we're going to use the value zero. So if it is uh, equal to zero, then we want to turn on the spindle. Then the, we're going to have a second branch. We want to make sure that even if the spindle is on, we need to have a uh, spindle speed that it's greater than zero. So if $SR, which is the spindle RPM, is greater than zero, then we're going to modify our macro and uh, or cycle command, and I'll put it at the end. So first thing we're going to do is modify the feed rate and we're going to divide it by or RPM or linear feed rate by the RPM. So it's going to give us a linear, uh, a linear feed rate per revolution. And then we're going to use the case for $P2 for the type of units we have. And we have when IPM, when MMPM, and when permit. And we close off the 
case and close the if statement. So when our IPM dollar P2 will equal to IPR. When MMPM dollar P2 will equal to MMPR. And same thing for per min dollar P2 equal per rev. And since we have done modification to dollar P3 and dollar P2, we can't just use output. We need to read, uh, rewrite the command correctly. And this one will just output the new value of all or arguments. And this is for the cycle tab command. There's no errors. I can click on OK and go to the next one. So just going to go in my global variable and I'm going to copy this variable since we're going to be using it a couple of times. So when we have our spindle, well, we don't have spindle in the list. So let's create a new spindle macro. And our format will be RPM, the value of that RPM, and then whatever comes after that uh, that value clockwise, and if you have other arguments that you need to input. So, if my if dollar P one is greater than my dollar max RPM, so this is the uh, system variable uh, that will get the information in the spindle section as your maximum RPM. Then uh, we want to output or spindle command since we are modifying dollar P1. We will output dollar RPM using dollar X max, X max, uh, max RPM, sorry about that. And dollar P2. And we will change our RPM factor equal to max RPM divided by dollar P1. And else, so if I'm less than the maximum RPM or equal to the nor, uh, maximum RPM, it is, we won't trigger an error, so I can just output and my factor equal to one. So I make sure that my factor is reset to one if I am le under the maximum load of the machine. And I'm gonna close my if statement. And for this command, this is okay. Then we need the second spindle command, which is when we are turning off the spindle to reset the factor to one and obviously turn off this, uh, this spindle. Like that. And then we need to adapt more feed rate for uh, with the reduction factor. So I'm going to create my feed rate using the fed rat major word. And I want to, again, make sure it's generic to whatever kind of units you are using. So our P1 in IPM, MMPM, and Permin. And afterwards, the numerical value of that feed rate and whatever, whatever information, oops, sorry about that. In fact, we won't need this. We'll just put it like this. And then I want to restate that command using $P1 and $P2, but multiply by my factor. Compile, and we're good. And the final one, we need to modify our cycle because cycles also have a feed rate, so we need to adapt that feed rate to that new RPM factor. So this, We'll use $P1 star, so whatever we have before units, then or units, again, use an IPM, MM, PM, and Permin for our numerical value, and whatever comes after. And we are going to re-output that command using the same units, 
but multiplying the third argument by the factor and the same fourth argument. Okay, so before testing, if we go testing right now, it's not gonna work on the tapping cycle because Genere, when we are matching the user-defined syntax macro, it looks into the order of the list, how they are listed inside of Quest. So right now, if I have a tap command, I will process my cycle tap before processing my feed rate adjustment. So we will never adjust that feed rate because in this cycle tap, we are changing the units to uh, per revolution units which would make that we are not in linear units anymore and this will not trigger. So what I wanna do is I wanna make sure my new command is the first one. So it will trigger as soon as we have a feed, uh, we have a cycle and everything will be okay. Then afterwards I can put my cycle tap here in the, in the right place. So if we go and activate uh, start in air. Just give me a few seconds, uh, and I'm going to choose my app source and open Genere. I have an error. Okay, let me try to cancel that and we will start it again. This I'm going to generate. Uh, so we don't lose it. And I'm gonna force it down and restart it again. Oops. So give me one second, I'm starting Genera again now. Okay, so this is our cycle uh, tap command. So we're gonna make a breakpoint there. And we're gonna put a breakpoint on the RPM just to see how it goes. And our feed rate command. And there's another cycle tap at the end just to see the difference. So if we remember, our machine has a maximum RPM of 15,000 uh, RPM. On the first one, we're gonna go at uh, 160. So we will be under the RPM, so let's just step inside of that RPM. And now we know that we have written the macro correctly because we have matched that command. And since this is less than maximum RPM, we will not step in the first branch and go instead in the second one. So we output and we have our factor still at one. And then we are okay. If we go to cycle tap, we, uh, we trigger the first cycle to update the feed rate correctly, but we have a factor of one, so that's okay. And then afterwards, we step inside of the cycle tap. The spindle is already on, and our spindle speed is greater than zero. So we will change our value, which is currently 9.5. If I press F11 once and look again, 
we are at 0 0.059 and or $P2 is IPM. So we will go in the first uh, case and change it to IPR. We can also see this in the variable window in the local tab, the new values. And then at the end, we have our cycle tab. So we exit our, uh, our macros and go to the next spindle, which is this one is higher than our maximum RPM. So 20,000 is greater than maximum uh, 15,000. So we will step in the first branch. So we reissue the first spindle. If we look here, we have our uh, spindle speed of 15,000 and we update our RPM factor, which is now 75%. So when we go to our first speed rate command, we catch it. We have 40 multiplied by 70, uh, 0.75. And if I click in the output, we now have 30. So we are okay. And we have the same thing if we, uh, just before the cycle tap, it's the exact same cycle uh, that we had at the beginning of the program that I repeated at the end. If we look at the feed rate, we are at 0 0.0594. And if I process that feed rate, so a step again, my RPM factor is this time 0.9375 because we are at, we were uh, supposed to output a 16,000 RPM if we look on the line to 12 in the input window. And now we're gonna process and the value is different. And if we click here, we are now at 0 0.006. So everything works here. So this is, a quick way of handling neutral DCL data or correcting some uh, arguments in some of your commands that would uh, prevent your machine from uh, working correspondingly. Okay, well, I would like to personally thank you for, uh, for coming today. Uh, and we are also looking forward to see you again in our next webinar. Uh, if you have any suggestion on uh, what you would like to see, you can uh, get in contact with us. Let us know what's, uh, what would be interesting to you, and we will be able to set a webinar for that. So again, thank you very much for coming, and I wish you all a good day, and uh, thank you very much.